we have Link Philippi, who is uh, with uh, Rough and Ready Lumber Company. He is the um, the president, and Jennifer was the uh, CEO, Jennifer Kraus Philippi. And uh, they were third generation operation in uh, in uh, Illinois Valley there with Rough and Ready Lumber, and the company celebrated uh, was celebrating their 90th year in business and. Uh, the effects of 85 jobs lost, and, and we talked on the break that this is a closure. This is a layoff. This is a closure. There doesn't seem to be any future for a continued business there, and it's just phenomenal to me. So welcome, Link. Uh, thank you. I thank know you. this is a tough time for you and yeah. your family. So. Well, thanks for having me. It's, uh, I appreciate you. Give me a call. You bet. Yeah. You know, uh, Link, what we've talked about, the, and of course it came out in a press release last week, but the 85 family wage jobs in CW has been fighting this fight for a number of years with the ONC lands and sure. just releasing that. But now you get into not just jobs, but families and the whole economy of Cape Junction. Right. The, the whole, that what? whole aspect of the state. Yeah. I mean, Josephine County, what are you seeing as far as the... Uh, the the city leaders over there and the commissioners over there. What do they have to say about all this? Well, there's there's not uh, there's not a lot they can they can do to help us. You know, we, this this mill it uh, losing these jobs is devastating to a small community like Cape Junction, and uh, it it just it doesn't have to be that way. But the reality is, this mill sits in a valley that's owned 80 percent by the federal government. And the federal government is not uh, isn't selling enough uh, isn't selling enough timber to make uh, to make even a small sawmill like Rough and Ready uh, able to operate uh, efficiently. So uh, it's it's a it's a federal timber issue, and it's uh, devastating on a community that's so dependent on on the resources that uh, that surrounds it. And you know the the the, the thing that is 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 just so perplexing and and so frustrating is the fact that federal policy on timber and timber production and so forth it's supposed to have a balance of of of, of environmental and and production issues right. and from your perspective where do you think the policy is i mean i know what your answer is going to be but let's <laughs> let, let's let the listeners hear it as well yeah uh, yeah, certainly the, the the forest is. I mean, the balance issue just it, we we swung the pendulum swung way to one size. It's uh, swung to the side of the uh, environmental community and uh, at the expense of uh, timber production. These uh, these forests are very productive forests and and they're very well protected. Uh, they grow. You know, just to put things in perspective, the. Southern Oregon forests grow about a billion board feet a year, every year. Yeah. And the harvest levels on these forests are currently, on the federal level, are about 50 million total. So you know, it's percent. growing a billion, and we're harvesting 5% of the growth. And that right. uh, we're, we're missing, and, and there's, there's plenty of strong environmental regulations out there to protect the resources, protect the water, protect the air, everything. We, we have good laws, great laws in place to protect the environment. Um, but we had just lost sight of the fact that these that these forests are so productive, and they provide so much in in jobs and county revenues, and uh, we're just we're we're missing the boat when we just can't figure out a way to harvest just a uh, you know a, a reasonable amount of timber off these lands. You know, Link, when we've talked before about the products that Rough and Ready. Uh, puts out. Mm -hmm. Tell us how widespread this is going to be. Tell us about the products, and then tell us where they go. Who buys your products, or who where they we, went? Where they went? Yeah, I mean, yeah. That's, I want to stay positive. Now. We um, we're a little different than some of these other mills in the region. We're uh, we cut uh, we cut a kind of a what I classify as a medium sized log, and our customers are looking for products that come out of these medium sized logs. We're not. We don't cut uh, predominantly dimension type products for the home construction industry. We cut products that go into window and door parts, and uh, we kill dry most of those products in our dry kills. And but our our customers are are it's a higher end product. We cut quality products that go to uh, throughout the world. We have customers in the Midwest and overseas, and it's uh, the product demand is for is for lumber that comes out of a little bit bigger log. And we're not talking old growth. We're not, we're not an old growth dependent mill. We've been classified as an old growth mill, but we're not. We're we cut 80 to 100 year old second growth, and those those logs are a little bit. They're a medium sized log. They're not you know a little eight inch uh, diameter log. They're a log that has the cuttings in it that our customers demand. Right. And it's about a 24 inch log. 
Pardon me? That's about a 24-inch demand. 24-inch uh, uh, is, is uh, uh, on, that's about the kind of log. We cut about between 20 to 24 inches uh, is, is an average log that we cut in the big sawmill. Yeah. Yep. Well, you know, that was that was disappointing. I, uh, a fellow by the name of George Sexton made the assertion that you were somehow an uh, old-growth uh, woodcutter, and I, and I wasn't, uh, wasn't available to respond but that wasn't uh, that wasn't the truth at all so that was we we'd have a we'd have a successful business if we'd ever cut another stick of old growth i mean that there's we, we don't we don't need old growth uh i i, I totally support the, the notion under this onc proposal to, to protect all the old growth i mean i the old growth not isn't the issue that issue was resolved a long time ago it's it's trees that are just a little bit bigger than small and that's uh that's the problem the environmental community has a hard time um, just accepting that a tree, you know, bigger than a tree of the size that we cut, which we we classify as medium, is uh, it's too big for them. And right. we just it, it uh, that's that's the that's the problem. Well, what I've found, Link, in the course of uh, mm -hmm. uh, the time that I've been involved with it, which has been a long time, yeah. uh, there is no making that group happy. No. They, they are so absolutist and radical in their approach on, on, the, uh, on the whole natural resources issues on federal lands. It's, it, they, they have a non-allowable, non non-use, non-utilization of natural resources on, on, on public lands, and it's just right. been, and, and, and it's not like you haven't tried. I mean, right. you, you folks have been fighting the battle. You had purchased a whole series of, of uh, different uh, wood available that's on, uh, but because of the court actions by these groups, you've been basically uh, stopped in your tracks, and yeah. it's too costly to proceed. We have uh, every sale we buy. You know, we have oh, I don't know. We we have three three BLM contracts that we're actually able to operate. But every we have four sales that are tied up, sold, and unawarded. Uh, um, and who knows when they're ever going to get? Uh, we'll ever be able to operate those sales. Um, but everything everything that we you know try to purchase gets is litigated in court. Every single sale, whether it's. Uh, I mean, it's not it's not what I call controversial type wood. It's uh, wow. relatively small to medium t size um, logs, but um, it's just everything everything is tied up in court, and nothing it, it makes it difficult and costly for the agencies to do anything out there, and they're not. You know, it, the, the, the the bad thing about that, and 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 really, it, it is a malicious approach to uh, to the law and the application of the law, mm -hmm. and it's destructive. It's destructive to the economy. It's destructive to funding for schools and communities. Right. It's been nothing but damaging, and and people marginalize that uh, in certain mm -hmm. communities, and it's really frustrating to I mean, try to bring out the point. It's like it's us like going into Iowa and says, well, well, you can only produce corn on. 50 percent of your land How about five percent yeah well five percent yeah i mean <laughs> this is the crazy part link that just blows me away is take 10 percent of the land and give it to them that yeah. i mean we're not even half of you're half of 10 percent you have five percent that you're operating in yeah it's just it's, it's phenomenal it's, it's, it's phenomenal not, yeah. um, anyway uh, you know link i do want to Commend you. you. You folks sort of were on the cutting edge. You created a, your own cogeneration plant there, right. which was completely environmentally friendly and uh, and very good utilization of resources in a way that was green and friendly and sustainable. And uh, you know, you got short shrift from that, and not not a lot of uh, accolades. And and I thought you should have, and a lot more. Yeah. You know, so it, it, we we kept saying for years that you know, the biomass people congratulated us on the new business model of you know going to biomass but we always said that biomass doesn't work without a dependable log supply to run this mill because right. right. you know our cogen plant uh, right now you know we're going to when we run out our inventories we're going to be uh, we're going to be shutting it you know shutting it down and not not certain of its future but uh, certainly you know it, it runs based you know on the fuel that we generate out of our sawmills and uh, and uh, the uh, uh, the, our demand to, to produce steam and, and uh, dry our lumber, and that's uh, without the, the two go hand in hand. Without a good log supply, uh, cogen doesn't work. It doesn't work on its own. So, well, well, Link, I want you to think about this, and yep. we're going into a break. But okay. uh, uh, Senator Merkley is up for re-election in a couple of years, and and uh, it might be a good opportunity for you to step up to the plate. And uh, <laughs> maybe that maybe that's a little stretch too. But uh, but anyway, <laughs> somebody's got to get their attention because uh, nothing else seems to work. Yeah, I don't know about politics. It's a funny game. Yeah, you, yeah. you should know about it. Yeah, it is. It is. It truly is. 
We have with us uh, a, our guest, and he is the president of uh, Rough and Ready Lumber, Link Philippi. And uh, thank you for being with us, Link, this you morning. Bet. And uh, I know this is a tough, uh, tough situation with uh, the the uh, closure of your mill. And it's not just a layoff; it's a closure because you 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 don't you don't see any bright future for the availability of product. Eighty-five families are going to be directly. Uh, uh, directly uh, impact in about 600 families when the indirect jobs are included to the community. It's going to be devastating, just devastating. So, Link, it, we, do, we do have a phone call here. Let's see if we can't grab that. Okay. Can you take a call? Yeah. All right. Welcome. You're on uh, KCMX. Good morning. This is Dwayne. Hi, Hi Dwayne. Yeah. How are you? Morning, Dwayne. Well, pretty good. Pretty good, you guys. Do you have a uh, question or comment for President uh, Link Philippi from Rough and Ready? I sure do. I'm wondering, and maybe they've already looked into it, or maybe it isn't cost-effective that they could contact uh, private timber holders. I'm thinking of the Warm Springs group up in Central Oregon to buy logs from them and bring them on down. Uh, I'm sure you've thought, thought about that, Link. But uh, oh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I can tell you, is that, you know, we our our mill, you know, where we're located, we uh, we sit we're in the Illinois Valley, and it's it's right. like I said, it's eighty percent owned by the government. We've been living for the last ten years uh, on on a private wood supply, and our trust me, we've gone out as far as we can go to find just the source of single ship of production for the sawmill. It's it's simply and, not economically feasible it, to it, to haul all that stuff. That when your working circle that, gets but, gets bigger and bigger. I mean, we're going out 150, 200 miles away from this operation just to bring a ship, one shift of production into this into this valley to run this mill. And we've, uh, trust me, I've, I've scrounged every private wood supplier that has wood that would that would fit us. And there's just about enough to run run one shift. But it, we're going so far away that every bit of every bit of margin that you have on those logs gets eaten up by transportation costs. Yeah. And what our our Big disadvantage is that our in our backyard is where our competitive advantage sure. is. It's the wood we source close to home, and we don't have that source coming off our federal lands, and yeah. that's that's our biggest our biggest competitive uh, disadvantage. And the and the same thing happened with the Boise lumber mill that shut down. Uh, mm -hmm. They couldn't get the supply of wood that they needed. Correct. Uh, uh, because of that very issue, the transportation costs were so great. That's that, correct. And we we were in the same boat. You know we. We uh, we competed against Boise for years, and and you know it was uh, there was more wood uh, being sold, but we all you know as the federal timber supply contracted, uh, we had to go further and further out to find wood, and uh, there just isn't that uh, that supply is is just isn't available for for a full capacity operation right now. Where what? is Senator Wyden in all this? Isn't he in charge of the what the Natural Resources Committee or? Well, he's just been appointed, but we don't find him, uh, uh, well, he was just here in the Valley, and uh, it wasn't a topic of discussion at all. So uh, I, I really, I don't know. I, You know, I've been sort of uh, railing against the senator uh, because he's just not effective, and he's basically said he's not supportive of the, the bill that's trying to be pushed through to create some kind of a compromise by the other congressmen, uh, right. the three congressmen. It's a bipartisan effort, and yeah, links, he's, links he's, from the of it. So. He's, Go ahead, not, he's not supportive of the ONC proposal. Uh, he does, uh, what he does support is, uh, is, uh, is thinning, and he supports biomass and county payments and uh, more wilderness and uh, standalone wilderness, and uh, none of that helps our situation. Um, it's... Uh, and it's not an economic model that works for any purpose. Thinning, thinning is not enough to. No. It, all he's doing is basically saying, "Well, we support the expenditure of federal tax dollars, citizens' tax right. dollars, to offset uh, what normally could be done in the course of creating real jobs and yeah. economy." It's an upside-down approach to the whole economic, environmental, sustainable right. issue that the timber industry can provide, and so. I, I think uh, I, I am disgusted. I'm actually yeah. I, I sent an I sent an email off to Mary Gatro, who was uh, Wyden's uh, sort of uh, point person on sure. this stuff. I say I says Mary, I'm done. Yeah, I'm done. You know, one thing, CW, is that on we can't on on the on especially on ONC lands we can't thin our way. We can't thin forever. No, on that's BLM. right. Yeah. We you'll get. To, I mean, I've, I've seen a study that that says we can go probably about another two to three years. And then all the thinning opportunities will be done. Then you got to tackle real harvest, and and that's uh, 
that's I mean we we can say thinning is great, but thinning isn't 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 a model that you can do in this region forever. I mean it's not it's it's a it's like an interim um, you know kind of less controversial way of, of of you know getting by the you know skirting by the issue. But the issue is uh, on these ONC lands is that you know what we have isn't all it's not all young timber. It's not all you know. Uh, Plantation timber that needs to be thinned or overstocked. It, it's it's uh, it's honest to God, you know, it's it's real real timber that uh, you just don't thin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, a little bit of a small interest in what takes place in that you've got 85 families that produce good income and support the activities in the Illinois Valley, and I'm involved in the in the Boys and Girls Club of Southern Oregon, and, and oh. these are the same families that help underwrite that club there in uh, Cave Junction, Illinois Valley. You're, you're seeing, Duane, you're seeing what's happening all around the state. Uh, oh, yeah. We're, we're, it, it, would be the sim, it would be the same as sitting neck deep in oil and not being able to touch a drop of it. <laughs> you know, and that's, a, in essence, what's going on. So, we're, we're in the middle of a grocery store and starving to death. That's exactly, exactly right. right. That's, that's exactly right. Thank thanks you, for Duane. your call, Duane. You okay, bet. hey, thank you, guys. Keep you bet. Yeah. All yeah. right. You bet. Bye. Well, that's a you know that's a good point. I, so, I I don't think people really understand and link you do yep. because you folks have been very involved in helping the community in so many ways uh, that this is an extension of what uh, a community is about and the infrastructure on community support for right. all kinds of the, a, a good example 4H. You know, uh, people are complaining in this county because we, we don't have the funding to sustain that program, and, and that's an argument back and forth and that we'll probably go through in the next few months. But, but the point is, the, the revenue to these uh, forested counties is, is not what it could be. Right. You know, and uh, I don't think people realize that it's devastating to libraries, it's devastating to schools, it's devastating to all the other answer, the Boys and Girls Club. Yeah. You know, you need people with good incomes and, and, and college uh, college funding and school funding and all of that, the kinds of things that make a community healthy and vibrant. Uh, right. When well, you have people working, they're paying taxes. When you have uh, forests that are working, they're paying, making payments to counties. I mean, everything works when you have when forestry is functioning properly. And it doesn't mean that we have to, you know, harvest at levels of the 1980s. We're talking just a reasonable harvest level. It's so strong and such a powerful economic engine in this in Southern Oregon. And we're just missing the we're missing the boat when we. I mean, we could go out here on the on the Siskiyou National Forest and just do roadside salvage, and you could you could probably source enough wood to run another shift here at Rough and Ready. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, uh, driving up to uh, Diamond Lake, there was enough roadside <laughs> roadside big big standing timber yep. that had been cut and 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 fallen into the roadway mm -hmm. that they moved off. I mean, it would have been a it would have been a huge. Yeah. Been, but you can't touch it. Right. You know, Link, I, I want to talk about the families and the multiplier of what is lost. When you take 85 incomes and take the multipliers and the tax base and everything else, when we come back after the break. But I also, you know, we talked about the sales being blocked. Tell us about what that is on supply. I mean, you, you mentioned that uh, when, when you make, you buy a sale, what's, what goes into that? And what's blocked there? Well, that's, well, yeah. go ahead. We, we um, you know, every, like I said, every, Pretty much every sale we ever purchase gets litigated these days. I mean, everything is, it's, so when you try to, when you're planning your operations, it's difficult to fill in, you know, federal timber into your mix because you never know when you're going to be able to operate or whether you operate it at all. Um, a lot of sales we had, uh, you know, we had sales that were, that were, uh, you know, tied up for four to five years that we never, never operated, but we always, you know, we always try to figure out where are you going to put those into your, in your operating schedule for the year, you know, you got to hire loggers and truckers and get everything, you know, lined up. But you, the uncertainty of, of when you could operate those sales made it really difficult to, to, you know, function as a as a business. But uh, we have sales. I mean, we have, uh, well, I don't know how much would we probably, you know, 14, 15 million feet of timber that were the, you know, the the uh, 
it's sold and unawarded with a high bidder, but we have no contracts on that wood, and that's, that's tied up for you know indefinitely in the in the court system. Now, do you get your money back on that if you say no. hey, we're done? <laughs> well, they don't um, get their money back. You do after a while, and if you, I mean, you can if you're you have you know bid deposits, and if you you know after a while, but, I think but, ninety days you can get your money back. The but, point is, you're out the money and the effort and oh. the the uh, ability to sustain yeah. your operations. Right. That's what. Yeah, we, that's we what need the logs to run the to yeah. run the plant exactly. If the deposits are, aren't aren't significant. It's yeah. the it's the timber being able to actually harvest and go in there and do the work you got to get done to, yeah. to bring logs in. That's Link. Uh, I got to tell you, it's uh, um, it's tragic. It's uh, painful to hear about uh, what's happened with your wonderful company. Yeah. Uh, you've got 85 families that are being impacted by this uh, closure of your mill, and this isn't just a layoff. It's a closure because of the lack of ability to survive. Uh, in the midst of one of the largest standing uh, timber reserves in the world, and you can't touch it with a ten-foot pole, no pun intended. So it, it um, it's frustrating for us. We've been, you know, for the last ten years, we've been you know, operating uh, at, uh, at half capacity, and and we we see, we live here, we know, we know what the potential is on these in these forests, and uh, just not being able to, to supply enough wood for a small operation like Rough and Ready. Uh, it's just uh, it's it's unconscionable that we can't figure something out uh, on these federal forests. You know, one thing I just want to say is you know we have to in our operation we have to you know, plow um, any any profits we make or any uh, we have to plow and reinvest in our operation, and we're prepared. You know, this in 2014, um, starting this year and into 2014, we're prepared to invest more money in this mill. We're we're eager. Uh, we're risk takers. We take we we love our business. And we're, we would want to take on and, and, and spend money on this, this operation to continue. The problem is that, that without an adequate log supply, we can't justify the investments. But, you know, if there was a reasonable hope for, for a log supply in our backyard, we'd make the investment. We would add 40 jobs. Instead of laying off 85, we'd add 40 more positions at this operation. they all be taxpaying, you know, productive people. And it's just a shame. It doesn't have to be this way. Um, it, we we have we have the desire and the ability to to grow this business with a with an adequate log supply. You know, Link. If uh, if we had a chance to um, talk to Senator Ron Wyden, who is uh, chair of the uh, natural what is it? Natural Energy. Natural Resources. Natural Resource yeah. Committee. You know, what would we say to him? What would you say to him, please? You know, what would you say? Well, it's just a sense of urgency that we we can't just continue on uh, as, uh, under the status quo we uh, there's there's we need so we need I mean this is this requires big ideas and this you know this uh, we were very uh, very supportive of this ONC trust proposal coming out of the house and that had lots of momentum the governor was is behind it and uh, but the sense of urgency these it's not just us that, that are that are looking at that lack of, of uh, timber supply it's all the other mills in the region southern oregon and and uh, and throughout the state there's just there's a real yeah. especially in southern oregon there's a real shortage of logs and it's uh it's the lack of, of federal timber uh well, being sold to the market link uh, can i tell you how many yeah. times we sat in in in, in the offices of uh, the senator the uh, senator wyden mm -hmm. and told him exactly that uh, and that we were losing our infrastructure, and all we got was, uh, in my estimation at this point, lip service. And my wife had the, the dubious distinction of going back with me because I could barely walk because of my knees and ankles. But, mm -hmm. but uh, with me to my last trip to Washington, and it was, uh, she was astounded. She said, "I, you know, I didn't realize how condescending, and how arrogant uh, our senators yeah. were until I sat in that yeah. room." And listen to multiple commissioners lament the economic status. It was, it was, it was almost. It was. It, I have to say, it was sort of pathetic. Yeah. Uh, you the, know, the, the sense, of the urgency is what needs to be emphasized. Is that we can't wait years for more planning and more, you know, NEPA reform and all kind, all these things. We, uh, county payments. Uh, I know the senator has been supportive of county payments, and he wants to continue county payments. County payments don't provide jobs. It's not an answer. And, it's and not the counties, the counties need jobs. They need, and and uh, you know, the, 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 we just can't continue languishing for two to three more years of planning and trying to figure it out. We've been trying to figure this out. We've been we've been in this in this situation since the owl listings in the early nineties. Twenty three years we've been facing these these timber issues that never seem to get resolved. It's a Washington issue. 
and uh, if, if they don't get, if, if something doesn't happen soon, um, there's going to be more following our path that, uh, that they just can't live without more public timber. Yeah, and, and, and Link, uh, I've stated that yeah. repeatedly, and so have other commissioners. Well, listen, we would rather have the, the, the income from the timber righteously, and we would rather have people working and, and working in, in the forest and stuff like that, and our forest being healthy instead right. of having to deal with the fires and the pollution and right. the dead standing trees and the right. disease that there. Klamath County is a perfect example yeah. of uh, how that uh, happened and so forth. So, right. so what do we do now with, with your, your employees that are now looking for work there's a severance pay. You're being just as fair as you possibly can with that. Wh where can we put these uh, individuals, these families, to help them make it through this time? Well, fortunately, the economy seems to be perking up a bit. I mean, that's that's another sad thing is that you know, our, it, we're we're shutting this operation down in a in a. I mean, the, the, the economy is decent. I mean, I think some of these are higher skilled. Uh, um, employees will find work. Uh, they'll they'll have job offers. Some of the. Uh, you know, there's offers for uh, retraining and, and school work. There's a lot of programs out there offered through the state, and uh, um, we're we're dialed into every um, every every one of them. And our employees, whatever we can do to help to uh, to help them relocate, find uh, find work, um, and retrain, go back to school. I mean, there's all kinds of opportunities um, for them, uh, which is good. I mean, it's, it's uh, there, there there could have been. There's worse times to be to be. Uh, um, laying off a crew, especially like in the middle of a recession, say two to three years ago, would have right. been devastating to uh, to everybody. But um, you know, we're we're doing our best. Uh, you know, we did give uh, severance to our employees, and uh, and we we care about them. These guys these guys have been working with us. You know, some of our employees forty years plus. You know, wow. these guys have spent a lifetime here, and we we're 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 going to take care. We're going to take care of them as best we can. I mean, this goes from a travesty to being disgusted. That's where I'm at. Yeah. I'm, I'm thoroughly disgusted that uh, we don't have better leaders that can't. I mean, we're talking 20 years in the making. We're yeah. talking 90 years in business. Yeah. And why would anybody mess with when, uh, with the supply when yeah. we're only tapping into 5% right. of federal land? Right. It, it's a, it's an interesting business because it does require. I mean, everything is good about. It. I mean, you have owners that are eager to invest and take risks. We have uh, we have great employees, skilled, hardworking employees. We have great markets. The only thing we don't have is it's adequate product. supply. Is the and, product? And we yeah. can't just go like a computer manufacturer go order more you know silicon chips to make more computers. We we need more logs and and that's just not. Uh, not available. Yeah. Can we step over Senator Wyden? No. There's no, no way to no, do that. No, no. I mean, it's blocked and, and unless unless another couple of senators from another state want to pick up the battle. But he's he's chairman of the Natural Resources Committee. Right. He can he can bring it forward to be heard. Yeah. And uh, all I've heard from him is, well, it just won't go anyplace. Well, that's not true. Well, we're going to invite Senator Ron Wyden on the show. So we're gonna we're gonna see if we can get some stand from that to see if it gets gets I don't know I don't know I don't I don't know where it would be any answer to that. So well anyway, uh, well we have gotten good support from uh, I know uh, the commissioners in Josephine County have been very supportive and and yeah. uh, they they're trying to do everything they can. They'll be making some more trips to Washington D.C. I hope they're a little more forthright and a little more vocal than they've been in the past because it's sort of embarrassing to see commissioners sort of go pleading hat in hand to our federal uh, legislators sometimes. And I, I, I get, I, you know, I get a little put off by that. And mm -hmm. I try to be as direct as I can. And, and uh, but, uh, but, but that's the problem, I think, is that uh, we, we have a tendency to be try to be too diplomatic yeah, we need to be a lot more forceful, a lot more direct about the seriousness yeah. of the problem. You know, Link, I'm yeah. thinking about the uh, the yeah. products that you put out. Yeah. Since since Rough and Ready is product is now not available. I mean, short in sh shortly, other products will have to come in and fill the void. Won't that mean that the other products coming in will be more expensive because of transportation, because of everything else? You know, I I our markets. I mean, our our lumber markets are far away, and I think they'll they'll be, you know, with the disappearance of of our product, you know, I think it's going to be hard on on our our customers that that depend on the quality that we make. I, I don't know where they're going to. There's other companies that we compete against that do that do make similar products, but there aren't a whole bunch of them. And there's, it's certainly going to create shortages. I mean, we're a small company, but we're we're kind of in a in a in a marketplace that's pretty specialized. 
and uh, somebody stepping up to fill the void. It's going to be, I think those products are probably going to be a little more costly. So I think that's... Right. And so what's going to happen is the consumer is going to pay more. Right. And there's going to be, I mean, if you take the supply that you've been providing, other companies, other businesses, other industries are now in trouble because their star supplier is now gone. Right. The the, the fallout is extensive. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So this is, this goes across state line. It's international at this point. Oh, yeah. 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 It's, uh, well, I, I do know that uh, I was approached by some uh, Chinese business people who said we will buy, and we will buy cut lumber. We will buy cut wood from uh-huh. you if you can supply it and just get it to the port in Coos Bay, and right. we'll be there to pick it up. And uh, and and uh, everywhere we went, we just couldn't get it. Just right. couldn't get it. And they they were looking at me like we, we've been to your we've been to your state. We've been in through your community. Yeah. And you have so many natural resources and so much available, and it can be sustainably grown. Yeah. And they're looking at like we're aliens, and they're right. In their in their eyes, we are the way we approach this whole problem. It, so it's just frustrating to see the the economic potential of what these forests can how they can support these counties. I mean, like Josephine County is broke. Curry County's broke. Jackson County's having its issues. There's there's a, a real power out there, economic power of of these forests, and we're there's uh, just and, and, and these you know, county budgets are so skinny and so tough to make ends meet, and it just doesn't have to be that way. It just there's so much out there. Yeah. No, I I agree. I I couldn't agree more. Link, uh, yeah. our hearts go out f- w- to you and your family and all of your workers and their families. And I wish there was more we can do. And yeah. we're not giving up the fight. We're gonna, we're gonna take it to uh, to where we think we can get something done. And that's to uh, Senator Merkley and Senator Wyden. And uh, and uh, they, they, I think they know what we're doing. And I think they've been reported. It's been reported to them that we're not real happy about that all. Yeah. about their their lack of action and lack of leadership so right we're, right. we're going to be doing something i just yeah, i worry about our communities i worry you know i will survive as our family will survive i I'm, i worry about our, our 85 employees i worry about the community here in the valley and uh and i worry about uh you know the future of our industry that uh you know that they're just you know things have to change if something can be come out of this uh this tragedy, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all for. It. I just wish that I wish something good and something bold will come out of Washington D.C. and uh, change this darn federal, federal timber policy around. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So well, now it's, just, it's yeah. just it's a dangerous situation related to the forest. It's yeah. a tinderbox out there. Oh yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. well, Link, thank you so much for uh, coming on the program, and we're going to continue the fight on this end. Yeah. So uh, keep stay, us posted. Call us anytime. Stay in touch. Okay. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, okay. you. Thank you. Right. Bye bye. Bye. We'll see you later. Bye. Wow. Who we? Link Philippi with the Rough and Ready Lumber, and let me tell you, that is an aching. I can't even. You, know, you put 85 people in the room, and you well, give them a stare and say, "Sorry, we're going to have to fire you because of no good reason." That mill is one of over 20 some odd lumber mills like that that had to close. Ray, thank you for calling. You have some well, experience. Well, you know, I, uh, uh, like I say, I'm, I'm kind of small potatoes in this market and everything, but we've got uh, some timberland, nice timberland, don't have a lot of it. But, you know, the people that are fighting the uh, uh, logging and stuff, they're even after the private people. Right. Uh, they're trying to shut everybody down. They don't want you to cut one stick of wood. And uh, I have people... Uh, this is above ash, and I have to live in Medford. But anyhow, I run into these people, and somehow they find out who we are. Um, and, you know, I'll stop by somewhere to get a snack or something in Ashland, and uh, some guy will come up, and and uh, uh, some of them are nice and neat, and some are dirty, and one thing, they're dirty, all kinds of people as far as looks. But their attitude about timber is the same. And that is that uh, they would rather have it burn, and I've had them tell me this right in so many words. They would rather have me uh, have uh, our timber burn than have it cut and sold to a mill. And I said, you know, you're sick. Yeah, uh, it makes no I, sense. I, I I don't I don't mince any words. I get right in their face, and and sometimes I say things I couldn't say on the radio. Uh, I try to watch my language, but the, those people are hard in my temper. No, I, Ray, uh, I agree with you 100%. 
I, uh, you know, it makes no sense, and it is sick. They have no skin in the game. We talked about that with, with uh, Link. What do they have to lose and everything to gain? In fact, they actually well, make money out of it. Well, well, the thing is, a lot of people don't realize these people are being subsidized, a lot of them. Uh, and I can't prove this, but I'm going to say it anyhow. A lot of the money is coming from overseas. And it's uh, the... Uh, World Wildlife Fund does a lot of good, but they also do a lot of bad things yeah. because uh, of their beliefs. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that the person that runs the World Wildlife Fund is Queen Elizabeth's husband. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, Mount Patton. And the, th the thing is, uh, I know a man, he lives locally, but he's, he's getting the age now, and unfortunately he's starting to lose with Alzheimer's. And uh, I wish that I had recorded some of the things that I discussed with him a few years back, but I didn't have enough foresight to do that. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is, uh, he knew Mountbatten and a bunch of those people personally because he was a military doctor and he was with the crew that traveled with the uh, people needed a, a, a crew, and we provided a crew to travel with uh, the celebrities and uh, important people and the politicians and stuff. And uh, he said uh, the one thing that got him was that Mount Batten is a very nice man to talk to, and he's got a good attitude a lot of things. And he says there's one attitude that just throws everything in, in uh, monkey wrench in the gears is that he says he'll sit there and tell you that he says we have to tell these people how to do this because they're not smart enough. Oh yeah, that's that that's atypical of the British royal approach. You know, and, uh, and, uh, you that's, know that's uh, kind of bugged me. And yeah. This this is, was a very smart man, and he he traveled all over the world, and uh, he well, knew so much. Well, Ray, that's the that's the old way of thinking, and now um, is folks are they're smart. Folks are smart. We've got a lot of smart listeners out there, and they get it. And I think the key is sticking together. Send a letter. Send an email. Make a phone call and let them know we're not messing around anymore. This is mm -hmm. this is uh, you're taking away from our families down here. Well, we, we we need to be more active and we need to stand up and say we need to protect our interests and our rights and uh, we need to protect our state uh, in in a way that provides jobs and an economy that works. Uh, it, it's not enough to be uh, expect everybody to uh, live out a water bottle and, and, and hike around the country and pay that pay pay for the bills and the trails and the forests and all of that stuff. So that's really that's really frustrating. Yeah. But uh, Ray, you brought up a good good number of points. Thank and you for calling. Thanks for your call, Ray. You bet. Have a good day. Right, we'll you see you. Too. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's it's uh, you know I was I sat in the boardroom at the Interior Department and uh, I sat and I was surrounded. There were about six commissioners from various forest counties there and we were surrounded basically by highbrow uh, fairly highly paid lobbyists from all these environmental groups and and they would start in with these platitudes about all of this uh, multiple use and, 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 and diversity and all that kind of stuff uh, of use and so forth and then and then well and then we piped up and said well okay uh, you believe in some degree of multiple how about some economic impacts how about some economic factors and they all their eyes all glazed over and they all took this kind of this and it was the head of the forest service the present head of the forest service and the head of the at the time the bureau of land management and uh, it was just, it was uh, all for naught, all for naught. It just, they, they could care less about jobs and the economy because it has nothing to do with their agenda. Nothing with, they do with them getting elected, you know, reelected. You know, well, I'm wondering. They, they, no, these were lobbyists. Well, they're, uh, uh, they are, and, and so uh, we're on our own. We're, we're basically, you know, there are two Oregons. There really are two Oregons. There's the Willamette Valley, Eugene, Salem, and Portland. And then there's the rest of Oregon, and and we're we're out on our own hook half the time. We're we're kicking and scratching to survive, and and actually our our two senators really don't need us to get elected as long as they they pander and kowtow to that element in that part of the, you know, and, and it's basically lip service. It's all token efforts. Uh, 
you know, we had high hopes that uh, there would be some kind of, uh, in the Applegate project, that there would be high hopes for timberable, merchantable timber coming off of those thinning projects. And the reality is they're not economic sustainable. They're on such a small scale. They're so piddling. Yeah. You know, well, it's, and, it's hardly worth the trouble. And you trust that the politicians will, ex you know, exude some leadership and look at the issues that the constituents need, not that the issues that they want to trump themselves. You know, and so it's like, okay, these are issues. These are the people. Are you going to take care of the people, or are you going to uh, take care of the own issues that you have it uh, that you want? I knew Wayne Morris. I knew Bob Backwood, and I knew uh, uh, Mark Hatfield. And I have to tell you, they were they were leaders. I mean, they got up on their hind legs and they fought for the state of Oregon. They fought for natural resources, but they did it in a balanced way. They weren't opposed to uh, protecting species at all. But the point was is that they fought at the right times for the right reasons, and they fought for Oregon's and Oregonians and or uh, Oregon jobs. And and that's the, that's what. That's what I'd really like to see, but I don't see it at all. I, I, I see fairly weak leadership in the two senators that we have. I don't see the kind of thing that they need to be aggressively going after. We had one here in town, Senator Wyden, and it was here for natural, natural gas, and he should have taken a tour of all the mills that have closed and taken an inventory of all the jobs and all the people out of work. And there's not enough tourism industry to ever, ever, compensate for the loss of those jobs and how they get around and seem to think that tourism will supplant that or the creation of additional wilderness zones uh, in the state. Uh, they're all great about wanting to create more wilderness, but they're not any, there's nothing there for them trying to actually do something in relationship to the economy of the state of Oregon. I mean, it's a natural resource. It's not like we're some private industry that's getting squashed for some reason. This is a natural well, resource that the state of Oregon it's, has. It's, uh, and it's their responsibility to a, protect it and let us use it. Well, it's 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 a management issue and it's a policy issue at the federal level, and it's gone awry. It, 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 there was supposed to be a balance. There's supposed to be a balance, even in the Endangered Species Act, which, by the way, the spotted owl population is still dropping, and you've eliminated the vast majority of utilization of forest and forest practices and the population of the spotted owl is still dropping and they seem to think it's going to probably be extinct because of the barred owl is overtaking it and it's predating on the spotted owl so that's enough of our frustration for today ladies and gentlemen